So how are you doing this morning? Good? Good. Good. How many had nightmares last night about Helga? <laughs> I remember when I had my rite of passage, did that. I leaned over to the guy before they knocked me out, and I said, uh, how'd you ever end up in this line of business? And he smiled, and he said, well, I was really into video games, is what he said. <laughs> well, talk about an impossible assignment. This morning, I have an impossible assignment. You can put the first slide up, if you would, please. Here's what we're going to be discussing. Understanding the woman in your life. Mission impossible. How many of you totally understand the woman in your life? Okay, that's what I thought. Well, there is a simple solution to this problem. Very simple solution. And what am I talking about? Well, watch the video screen. We've only been married a short time, and we like to share everything. But we noticed some subtle things we couldn't share. Well, subtle things that happen every 28 days or so. <laughs> it's, it's nobody's fault. Well, just nature doing its job. But it didn't seem right that I was excluded. Well, thanks to the wonderful people at Merck Frost, we can both now share the PMS experience. Monthly man. It allows me the privilege of the female experience. Each capsule contains tiny time-released hormones that surge through your system, taking you on the emotional roller coaster ride of your life. It's beautiful. I never realized how wonderful. No, no, no. Don't worry. Don't worry. I'm here now. What's that supposed to mean? You going somewhere later? Listen, we'll eat some ice cream and talk about it. I look bloated to you. <laughs> Monthly man, because you don't know any better. So all those of you who are interested in that solution, we have shots for you right afterwards. You'll get your N1H1 shot and your monthly man shot. It'll fix you right up. I don't think any of us want to take that approach, right? So we've got the tough approach. We've got to take the tough way. Several years ago, I was doing a marriage, and uh, I walked back to meet with a groom. And it was kind of unusual because he was a young man that I'd trained and mentored, and now he was a naval officer. And so he had it all wired together. Normally, when I go back, the groom's still trying to figure out how to get this thing buttoned. He's never worn before in his life. And he's terrified because he's going to have to go stand and speak in front of people. So when I lead him out, it's kind of like dead man walking, you know, this guy behind me. He's just kind of stumbling until he sees the bride. But this uh, young man, he was sharp. We walked out together in order, and we stood at detention up on the stage waiting for the groom to get position. He got position. And then it was time for the bride to come in, and they had an archway of swords, which was just like our wedding. And she stepped forward, beautiful white dress, jet black hair. And I was doing okay until she passed by, and I saw my wife in the audience. And I started losing it. I started coming unglued. The only wedding I've ever been to where the bride had to say to the pastor, come on, pastor, suck it up. You can make it. Come on, come on. I'm going, just sitting up there losing it. All the memories came back. Putting everything we had in the backseat of our cars. We went from duty station to duty station as I went through flight training. I remember my daughter being born, our first child, standing in the... Uh, Sitting in the hospital looking through the window and realizing, I better grow up. I got a little girl that's going to be counting on me. And my son was born, and I thought, man, I really got to grow up. I've got a guy, I've got to train how to be a man, and I don't have to be a clue how to be a man myself, following God. And then our first Christmas together, all four of us, not a penny to our name in theological graduate school. And how many times I've turned to this woman in 41 years, and just been overwhelmed by how much I love her and how much she loves me. But sometimes that woman could drive me out of my cotton picking mind. <laughs> I will turn to her and I'm going like, what planet are you from? What I want to do is take the few moments that we have this morning together and look at the challenging issue of your sexuality. It's one of the defining characteristics of fundamentally who you are. When you came into this world, as one of the first identifiers. It's a boy. It's a girl. And I want to look at the issues that can so easily rip across your soul 
in husband-wife relationships. And for those of you who are single, you really want to take notes today. It'll save your life. I mean, you, in just a moment, this person you love so deeply, so richly, so completely, so fully, you can be at odds in a microsecond. And I want to look at that dynamic. What produces that? Why? Well, where should we look? Well, there's one classic book in the Bible. It's a song of songs, the greatest love song ever written. True story. It's the greatest love song. How can you say that? Because the title, Song of Songs, tells you this is God's definition of the greatest love song ever written. Because in Hebrew language, the superlative is a different structure than English. In the Hebrew language, if you want to say something is the very best of the best, you repeat the term. That's why it's a song of songs. This is the greatest romance novel ever written, but it's not a novel, it's a true story. That's why we call Jesus Christ King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is Hebraicism. And I remember when I was teaching at the undergraduate level, and guys would come to me and say, uh, Dr. Roberts, what's uh, the Song of Songs about? I said, well, it's exactly what it, you think it is. It's the hottest romance novel ever, ever written. It's just one steamy book, to say the least. I mean, it's about the love relationship, passion relationship with a husband and wife. It's not about Christ and the church. If you want to allegorize it, you can, but that's not what it's about. And, and I always say to him, now the best translation, if you want a really good one, it's the Living Translation. We'd sell out in the bookstore the Living Translation every time I'd say that. Guys would run down and get it. Now, <laughs> let me give you a little background if you're not familiar with it. Most guys don't read it for devotional literature. If you're, uh, in, the Hebrew, <laughs> if you're in the Hebrew culture, you couldn't even read this book until you're 30 years of age because it's so steamy. 10th century B.C., Solomon is the most eligible bachelor on the planet. And he travels up on a working vacation to the northern part of his kingdom in Galilee. And he falls head over heels in love with the farmer's daughter, Shulamit. And the first several chapters, we, we get to listen in on their dating psych sequence. We get to listen in on their romance. We get to listen in on their honeymoon night as she does a belly dance for her husband. I mean, it is a phenomenal book. And it's just red hot good. But then you always come to something interesting. And that's found in chapter 5. Song of Songs, chapter 5. You know, I have a Bible, it'll appear on the video screen. Now, one other thing. It's written like an old Hollywood musical, you know? The old Hollywood musicals where the guy would go, ah, and the gal, gal and then they have a chorus in the background singing. So it's kind of written in this kind of flowery language. I'll have to translate it for you, okay? So we'll begin at verse 2. Now, she's singing. She says, I slept, but my heart was awake. Listen, my lover is knocking. Open to me now, he's saying, open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my flawless one. My head is drenched with dew and my hair with the dampness of night. Translation, I'm standing out here in the pouring rain when you open the stupid door. <laughs> and she begins to sing again. I've taken off my robe, must I put it on again? I've washed my feet, must I soil them again? I've got a headache, I'm not interested. My lover thrust his hand through the latch opening. My heart began to pound for him. I rose to open for my lover, and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with flowing myrrh on the handles of the lock. I opened for my lover, but my lover had left. He was gone. My heart sank at his departure. I looked for him, but did not find him. I called him, but he did not answer. Is that a classical husband-wife situation, or what? Now, when I'm dealing with a therapy group, I'll take a group of guys who are struggling with sexual issues in their life, and one of the toughest things for men in our culture to understand is healthy sexuality. When I'm dealing with guys that are struggling, I'll say, okay, what, 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 is your, what is your ideal healthy sexual experience for your wife look like? And they'll go blank. They know how to have intercourse, but they don't know how to have an intimacy. So I'll, I'll ask them, I'll ask them as we'll read that, I'll say, so what's the problem here? And they'll go, well, she's angry. I go, nah, wrong. No, see, the problem, gentlemen, is the definition of intimacy. If you ask a man to define intimacy, sexual intercourse, I mean, you know, you wrote out all the definitions of sexual intimacy, intercourse, 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 you have to go to about page 15 before you find anything other. For a woman, 80% of her sexual needs are met simply by being held. Oxytocin flows through her body. She's fulfilled at that point. And see, the culprit here is testosterone. You have 10 times the level of testosterone that your wife has, and only one-fifth the level of estrogen. The culprit? Yeah. The scientists were monkeying around with some monkeys, and what they did is they took the female monkeys and they filled them full of testosterone the same level as the male monkeys. Well, then the female monkeys started acting like the male monkeys, sexually. Now, when I tell that to a group of guys, hands start going up. Uh, Dr. Roberts, yeah. Where, where can I get some of that? I like to put it in her tea in the morning. It'd make a great day. 
Well, there's a couple problems that about six months she'd be shaving with you. <laughs> and about a year down the road, she'd be in arm wrestling and whooping you. <laughs> See, from the first pages of Scripture to the last pages of Scripture, there's this creative cry from the heart of God. Not to create quasars, pulsars, galaxies. Let's create mankind in our own image. Genesis chapter 1. Let us create, let us, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, let us create mankind in our own image, male and female, he created them. The image of God is not found in maleness or in femaleness. The image of God is found in male and femaleness coming together. The only place you see the image of God on this planet is not the beauty of the surrounding area. It's in the husband-wife relationship. The holiest place in your house is the bedroom. That's why hell absolutely hates a healthy marriage relationship. Because when there is intimacy, not just intercourse, but when there's intimacy between a husband and wife, there is a display of the character of God. And the forces of hell will do everything under their power to deface that. That's why there's such an onslaught against men's lives now who have said yes to Christ with respect to sexual issues. Because if he can get you pulled away from healthy intimacy, then he defaces the image of God, and he makes your testimony for Christ a living joke. Because the most powerful testimony you have in a community is not passing out tracts. It's a husband and wife that love each other, can't keep their hands off each other, and are passionately in love with Christ. When you see that, people will say, I want that. Now, I've counseled men for 30 years on this issue. And I had guys come into my office, and I look at their back, and that's usually what I find. There's a big female footprint in the middle of their back. <laughs> you go see Dr. Roberts. <laughs> you come in and I'll say, do you want to be here? No. My wife made me come. Okay, well, the Blazers are not doing real good. Seahawks, we don't know what's going to happen there, so we don't have much to talk about. So uh, you put your ex in the box. Uh, let's not waste your time and my time. Let's just call it quits. And you go out there and wait till the pain level gets high enough, then you come see me. But don't wait too long, because this thing will gut you spiritually. It's like getting in a foxhole with your enemy. He's got a bayonet, and you don't. You're not coming out alive on this one spiritually. And if you don't deal with it, I guarantee you, you'll pass it on to your kids. The curse will go to the third or fourth generation. But the blessing of God will go to the thousandth generation. So you're in a spiritual battle in this area. You may not be struggling in this, but I guarantee you the guys around you are. So we, we have a problem here, gentlemen. Maybe I, can, maybe I can put it this way. How many of you would like to increase the understanding of your wife by at least 200%? Anyone here would take that one? Better raise your hand or the guy next to you will tell your wife you didn't raise your hand. <laughs> now, increase by 200%. There's some qualifiers here, okay? 200% of nothing is still nothing. I need your help. you got to engage. This is not like passive preaching. And I said increase your understanding. I didn't say you'd get more comfortable. When you understand her, it'll challenge you even more so than you are right now. Now, once again, back in a the therapy group, I'll ask that same question. And so the guys will say, yeah, yeah, I like that. Okay, okay, let, let's go through Genesis 1 and 2. Let's go through the creation account. And I, and I want to ask you some questions. Go ahead and read it. Go ahead and read it. How many verses did God use to describe the creation of Adam? One. How many verses did God use to describe the creation of Eve? Six. Does that tell you anything? <laughs> they usually don't get it, so I have to keep going. <laughs> so I'll take them through the divine setup. You remember what happened? God created Adam, and then he said, well, why don't we just name all the animals? And he goes, well, that looks like a giraffe. That looks like an orangutan. That looks like, you know, a hippopotamus. But God, none of them turned my crank. The guy says, well, I'm glad you noticed that. Why don't you take a nap? So he does a rib job on him. Does a rib job on him and brings Eve to him. And I wish they would translate it literally. He says, here's Eve. And he goes, wow, it's bone to my bone, flesh to my flesh. Good job, God. <laughs> wow. You know, I'll wrap her up. No, on second thought, don't wrap her up. I'll take her just as she is. But I guarantee you, six months down the road, here's what's happening. God, here's this knock on his door. God, we got to talk. Why? 
This woman is driving me nuts. You told me, you told me she was the only one that turned to crank. Get to work. Now, it's interesting when you look at the Hebrew, it says when God created Adam, he just created him. He just kind of put the dirt, dirt together. It's kind of the creation of the original dirty old man. Just, you know, right like that. <laughs> but this is crucial. The, the author uses the words very carefully. He said when he created Eve, he ashav her. It's, it's a term that's used to describe the work of an artist. It's something of beauty. Now, I'm talking to the guys. They, they still don't get it. Uh, you look out there, and the lights are on, but no one's home. So either you tell a flying story or a car story. One of those are two options, if you're going to make any sense to guys. So I usually use this car story. I was watching TV, and they were interviewing this multi-gazillionaire internet whiz kid, and he had this incredible mansion. And the reporter looked over, and he had seven car garage. He says, you have a car in every one of those? He says, yeah. He says, can I see him? So I went over the first one, pulled up, the, pulled up the door, and it was a Ferrari in there, you know, beautiful red, a million pieces, just an incredible piece of machinery. Next door is a Lamborghini about this high. It looks like it's going 200 miles an hour, just sitting there. Goes down all the way to door number seven, pulls it up. There's this old beat-up Ford pickup truck. And he's going, why, would he, why do you have this old beat-up Ford pickup truck? He says, well, I, I have that one because it starts whenever you turn the key on. The other ones, I've got to have mechanics to keep them repaired. See, gentlemen, you sexually are like the Ford pickup truck. <laughs> Your wife is like a Ferrari, okay? She can have multiple climaxes three different ways. I mean, you're going, oh, really? I didn't know that. See, sexually, you're like, electrically, you're like a light switch. On, off, on, off. She's like an iron. Plug it in and wait and wait and wait and wait. <laughs> Wait and wait and wait and wait and wait. And wait and wait and wait and wait and wait. See, if you want to understand the woman of your life, you want to increase your understanding of the woman in your life by 200%, you need to understand two very important words. Totally different. Radically different. She, women are not just funny-shaped guys, okay? <laughs> now, if you don't understand that, you'll wound her and not even realize you're doing it. For example, when you go out to out to a fancy place to eat it, you know, sometime. Who's almost always ready first? You are, why? Well, you know, she's got to look, what? Beautiful. You know, you got your pants on, that's all you need. You're ready to go. <laughs> Let's go eat. Or she goes out and buys something, brings it home. The first words out of your mouth is, how much did it? Gosh, she's not worried about that. That's your problem. See, she's bringing something of beauty into the house, and you're asking, how much did it cost? Have you ever noticed this? You see a bag lady moving her cart down the street. She'll have a flower, a ribbon, a touch of beauty on her. When you see a woman who doesn't have a touch of beauty on her, you're looking at a traumatized woman. You look at a woman that's dressed in, you know, Saks Fifth Avenue outfit, but you look at her eyes and there's no beauty, you're looking at a traumatized woman. See, when you cut off her desire for beauty. You truncate just foundationally who she is. I mean, it's so crucial that you understand the unique creation that God gave you. And if, if you give her half, half a chance, she'll support you like no other man, no man ever could. My wife cried every night for the first two years of our marriage, cried herself to sleep every night. Because I got up at four or five o'clock in the morning, was gone at 11 o'clock at night, seven days a week. All I cared about was flying. I told her, I said, if it comes between you and airplanes, you lose. And she went, okay. She thought she would change me. I got worse. But she wouldn't give up on me. She brought the best out of me. So the question, maybe we can put it practically this way. How do you bring out the best in the woman in your life? Well, first of all, the first foundational thing that you have to do, you have to accept their uniqueness. Like I said, women are not, women are not funny-shaped guys. And the thing that is the most different between you and your wife, listen carefully, gentlemen, she has a totally different brain than you do. There is a male brain and there is a female brain. And it completely adjusts your perception of reality. For example, uh, women have a much more acute sense of color perception. Only one out of 200 women are colorblind. Uh, eight out of 100 men are colorblind. 
And that's why we wear blue, black, or brown. I mean, just look around. That's about our only options. A couple reds out there and oranges. That's because of the beavers. That's about it. Well, so what? You can have these silly arguments. I remember not too long ago, we were down shopping, and uh, I was over in the sports department looking at some stuff, and my wife drags me over to the furniture department. She had all these, all these cushions laying up. She said, I, I want to know which, which shade of fuchsia would best match our curtains at home. And I'm, I can't even see the difference. <laughs> I'm looking at, and she got mad at me. I said, I can't tell the difference. It's just you have arguments over that. And her, her sense of smell, depending on the time of the month, will sometimes be 1,000% more sensitive and acute than yours. That's why she doesn't appreciate you laying your dirty laundry in the house. She didn't get a real kick out of that. And her sense of taste is much more acute than yours. But the primary thing is she is able to process much more information than you are. You see, she has 40% more connective tissue between the left side of her brain and the right side of her brain. She's getting a lot more data. Why? Because when you were eight weeks old in your mother's womb, your brain was flooded with testosterone and it unzipped your brain. <laughs> you have a totally different brain. You function left, right, left. She's going left, right, left, left, right, right. Okay. Well, so she's getting all this information. Well, so what? That means you can both go work eight hours a day, which is common in our culture today. You come back home. What do you want to do? You want to eat? Sit and watch ESPN and suck your thumb. <laughs> what does she want to do? She wants to talk about the eight hours of work that she had, and she can talk for another eight hours. Okay. Women tend to be holistic. Men tend to be linear. Women tend to be holistic. They're picking up all kinds of data, reading between the lines. Men tend to be linear. Now, this is no big deal until you put each other under pressure. Then what happens, a typical guy, when you put him under pressure, I'm classic, I will withdraw into my cave and try to get all the ducks lined up before I make a decision. My wife will do what? She'll want to talk about it. And talk 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 and talk. She'll reason verbally out like this and just start talking. And I'll withdraw further into my cave and I'm no longer emotionally available for her. Sets up real conflict. That's exactly what you say in Song of Songs chapter 5. Now, where it gets really tough is where you're under a lot of pressure. You don't withdraw from your cave. Instead, you put your Mr. Fix-It cap on. You're going to fix her. Oh. If you're single, take notes. Don't do Mr. Fix-It. She'll take you off right about the knees. Or one of my classic, because we always, uh, we, we worked in the church together, now we work in pure desire together, and she'll be talking about the ministry, and I'll draw my sword out to defend myself. I'm not emotionally available for her. Here's four words that'll save your life in marriage. Four words that'll upgrade your relationship. I need to listen, period. You don't need to solve the problem. You don't need to resolve it. You just need to listen because she's not asking you to solve the problem. She's asking you to listen to her. And when you do that, then there's a capability for intimacy to be developed. Remember, intimacy is not being comfortable and close. It's being uncomfortably close. And that's almost always in dialogue. Now, I know my wife is classic. She's very verbal. And she'll start talking. It's like Mr. Pac-Man, you know. And I'm just going, ah. And you can take the Terminator option and go, ah, I'll be back. You know, and you, ah, 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 ah. But make sure you come back in half an hour. And listen. That's all she wants you to do is listen. Not solve it. Listen. Second of all, accept their uniqueness. Number two, affirm their value. Affirm their value. Romans chapter 15, verse 7 is a great passage. Accept one another just as Christ has accepted you in order to bring praise to God. You know, the number one complaint, I've been listening to ladies for 30 years in the counseling office. The number one complaint that women have, he doesn't listen to me. And primarily, I, I suspect that as I've listened through the years, I suspect this is a dynamic that's taking place. Men tend to solve problems from the outside in. Women tend to solve problems from the inside out because they're reading between the lines. That's just the way they tend to do it. I remember when I went to cemetery, uh, seminary, pardon me, um, I, I showed up, and I had, I had a 
green plastic living Bible. That's what I had. That was the first Bible I could actually read. And I walked down to campus, and these guys had 400-pound black Bibles. They had to carry with forklifts. You know, they had Greek and Hebrew and Sanskrit and Aramaic. And I mean, it was just like, and it was just like unbelievable. These guys were so much in the church and all. And I, I, I just was a committed pagan. I just met Jesus. And so I rode my motorcycle to a, a seminary, and, and, I, and I just said to my wife, I said, well, I'll just wear my, my regular military gear. It'll save us money. But you know the real reason I was doing it? Because I could wear my flight jacket and all my patches on it. Combat fighter pilot, 1,000 hours. See, I'm bad. Because <laughs> I was terrified. I'd given up everything, walked away from a career, and here I was going to fail. And so I started becoming more and more arrogant. My wife was just, oh, she's going, oh, we're in this holy place, and my husband is turning into an arrogant idiot. But I married far beyond my means, like most of you did. She didn't say anything to me. She just started praying. One day, I parked a motorcycle, and I started walking across the common grounds. And, and the Lord said, why, why do you have your flight jacket on? And God doesn't ask questions for information, okay? <laughs> He's really smart. You can't believe how smart he is. He doesn't ask questions for information. He's hoping you might catch it. And I said, well, it's, uh, it's, you know, we can't afford it. He says, like, am I broke? You don't think I can't bless you? Well, why are you wearing the flight jacket? Oh, I said, I just need it. He says, it's hot out. Why are you wearing it? I says, because I'm afraid. I'm afraid I'm going to fail. He said, get rid of the jacket and start trusting me. I went back home and I said, honey, I'm going to get rid of the jacket. And I've been arrogant for the last couple months because I'm so afraid. And I remember she went, hallelujah, the kingdom is here. <laughs> she saw it all along. I couldn't even see it till God confronted me. And, and women can see deep inside of you. I'm in working on the bathroom, and when I fix something, we have to hire to have someone come to fix the fix that I fixed. <laughs> but I'm in there doing the husband thing, and my wife comes in, and she says, how's it going? I said, fine! She turned around and just walked out, you know. And I know what she's going to do. She's going to go talk to God. I'm in trouble. I'm in deep trouble. And she's not going to go complain to God. She's going to be crying out to God for me. So I'm, I'm in deep doo-doo. You ever been in a situation, you're waiting for your wife to come back, and you're thinking of all these explanations and excuses of why you just act like an idiot? Well, she went and talked to God. She walked back in. She said, hi, hon. Can I, can I say something? I said, sure. She said, have you ever noticed when you work on the house how angry you get? <laughs> doom. And that doom was not her, it was God. Reason why? Never had a dad. Never showed me how to fix anything. So I'm working on something and fumbling, bumbling, and I feel like an idiot. My wife can ask a simple question, and I explode. Here she saw right down into the core of my being. What a gift. That's why when I'm trying to find out if I should team with someone in ministry or should be part of the staff, I will do all the clinical stuff. And, but you know what I'll, then I'll do? I'll, I'll ask my wife to go to lunch with us. And she'll just sit there and not say anything and we'll talk. And, and we had a great conversation. The guy got all the right answers and so work. And I said, isn't he great? She says, don't trust him. I said, why? She can never give me a logical explanation. But she's always right. She's seeing right between the lines. She's reading right between the lines. Now, another thing that makes this thing a little bit complicated is, see, she goes through a 28-day cycle. <laughs> she can love Jesus, be filled with the Spirit, be walking with God, but she, she's doing this. You know, the normal guy, he's like steady Sam. And she's just going all over the place. Okay? Therefore, women can get caught in the waves, guys can get caught in the caves. And this can set up a unique sequence. What will happen is that she'll be going down and you will do something and she'll come back up and you'll go, I fixed her! I fixed her! She's never going to go down again! No, she's going down again. Well, what's going on here? God created her that way so you'd understand something. Nothing is forever in this life. And you need to stay close to her. And what you dare not do is when she's going down emotionally, 
and it doesn't make sense to you, like I'll sit down with my wife and I say, I'm going to be on the road now for these next two months, and we're going to do this and this and this and this after I get back. It's going to be tremendous, and I'll be gone. And she'll say, oh, you're always gone. And I, and I start, just start lecturing. We talked about this. When she's going down, the last thing she needs is a lecture for you for why she should not feel that way. That's the last thing she needs. She needs you to walk beside her. Because when you cut off her emotional lows, you're going to cut off her emotional highs, and she'll lose the capacity to love you as deeply as she could. Now, where this gets really interesting is in our culture, because 40 to 60% of women in our culture have been abused, physically, emotionally, or sexually. Now, if your wife's been emotionally and sexually abused, it can be really a challenge for you as a man. Because if you get self-centered and self-focused and she is reacting to a sexual stimulus because of her trauma, it can be very challenging for her. It's a little bit like this. It's like her life is like a, a beach, a beautiful ocean beach. But what happened is in her past, someone picked up and pulled up all this garbage and put it in a dump truck and came and dumped it in the beach. And when the tide goes out, the old tire comes up, the old car comes up, whatever. And so when the tie goes out emotionally for her, and all of a sudden she starts reacting, it's not about what you did, it's about her past, but when you understand that and you can stay stable, and you've said yes to Christ and the power of God's at work, with you, you have that capacity, and you're not self-focused, when you can stay stable, then the two of you can take that old tire out and throw it away, send it back to hell where it belongs. Amen. And there will come a day, sir, where you'll walk along a moonlit beach together and the tide will be out and she'll look to you with tears in her eyes and say thank you because you will have given her what no man could ever give her. Only a spirit-filled, godly husband can do that. But you have to confront your selfishness down to the very core of your being because when you get sexual, if it has to be about you and she's been abused, then you're asking for an explosion. And instead of giving her the great gift, you will give her a further wound. I'm so thankful for my wife. I'm so thankful for her. I mean, I didn't have a clue how to be a godly husband. I'd never seen one. Seven abusive stepfathers? Come on. I didn't even have a clue. You know, I've never met, I've never met a man who doesn't want to be his wife's hero. I've never had a man come into my counseling office and say, Dr. Roberts, could you show me how to have a messy divorce? I'd really like to have a good rip-roaring killer. You show me how to tear my kids up? I'd really like to have a handle on that. Never had. I've never met a guy who doesn't want to be his wife's hero. But there's four words that put the fear of whatever in any man's heart. It's when your wife leans over and she goes, we need to talk. Oh, God, anything but that. Put a 357 to my head and put the hammer back. Send me on a mission downtown Hanoi with no backup. Anything but that. But I'm so thankful that my wife, through the years, she would say, we need to talk, but I always heard from her at the same time, I will never give up on you. She communicated the outlandish, unbelievable, scandalous love of God to me. I mean, time and time again when I messed up, she kept communicating the love of God to me. That's the reason we're still married after 41 years. And that's why God's grace is so foundational to being able to understand the woman in your life. I mean, talk about an amazing love story from the first statement of Adam going, not your way, but my way. There's this passionate, dynamic love story that breaks loose. I mean, God just talking about doing wild things, parting the Red Sea. Yeah, walking on the water. I mean, fill in the blank. It's just amazing miracles. But the thing is, the greatest miracle of all was that he came and walked among us in the flesh. With nail-scarred hands, he healed the sick and raised the dead. But that was just intro to the most beautiful, most romantic, most stunning picture that was ever gonna. When the curtain was pulled back, I think the angels just absolutely guessed. It was God in the flesh, stark naked. He didn't have a loincloth on. Strung out to die for you and I. And that forever bridged the chasm between sinful man and a holy God. Therefore, there's no difference between a man and a woman that cannot be bridged by the love of God. It cannot be bridged by that. And that's a message that needs to be understood because, you know, the divorce rate in conservative Christianity is actually higher than the secular community. 
It's actually higher. Because we, we, we just don't grasp the love of God worked out in practical ways. I remember uh, when I was running a counseling office for a church, I'd just gone through all the training and stuff, and I looked down at the counseling menu, and I saw that this 60-plus-year-old couple was coming in, and I'm going, man, you know, I was in my mid-30s, and I said, what can I say to them? And I just started praying, and the Lord said, um, I want you to ask him this question. So he came in, and a typical conflict, you know, he's sitting here, and she's sitting there, and you can just sense the tension in the air. And I said, you know, I could do all the counseling stuff, and I've taken all the classes, but I'm not going to do that because, I mean, you've got so much, I mean, you're an elder in the church. You've got so much experience beyond me. Uh, I, I just want to ask you one question. What do you have against your wife? And it was like all the blood drained out of his face. He said, how'd you know that? I said, don't worry about it. I said, what do you have against your wife? He went, well, she committed adultery 15 years ago. What do you expect me to do? I said, uh, you, you, you want to you wanna explain this to me? You know, she committed adultery, right, 15 years ago? Yeah, okay. And so you've been living in hell ever since then? Does that make any sense? She said, well, now that you put it that way, maybe not. And I said, you know, I, I, I don't know what to do exactly, but could, could we do something? Could you just kneel down here and you just pray for each other? Could you do that? He said, well, I think we could do that. I remember they knelt down, and I said, sir, you go ahead and lead first. And he took his wife's hands, and he began to pray. And it was like this man had a terracotta mask on, and it just began to shatter. In his spirit, you could see it. And all of a sudden, they collapsed into each other's arms. And I remember he looked up at me, and he says, I've wasted so many years. So many years. And I said, yeah, but the years of the locusts and cancer were going to destroy it. God can restore to you. And they began to kiss and hug, and they were going for it. And I went, okay. okay. You know, I'm, just, you know, I'm going home to see my wife. You guys are just <laughs> lock the door. And I saw what God could do. Well, what, what, is a, what does a great marriage actually look like? I close with this. Gentleman by the doctor, uh, name of Dr. McQuilkin, he wrote about his marriage of 40 years. This is a true statement. Here's what he had to say. Dr. McQuilkin writes about his marriage of 40 years. It's been a decade since that day in Florida when Muriel, my wife, repeated to the couple vacationing with us a story that she had told five minutes earlier. Funny, I thought, that's never happened before, but it began to happen occasionally. Then he writes how she is diagnosed with Alzheimer's and begins a long, slow descent. And he comments on how his life changed. She's such a delight to me. I don't have to care for her. I get to. One blessing is the way she's teaching me so much about love, for example, God's love. She picks flowers outside, anyone's flowers, <laughs> and fills the house with them. Lately, she's beginning to pick them inside as well. Someone had given us a beautiful Easter lily, two stems with four to five lilies on each stem with more to come. One day I came into the kitchen, and there in the vase over the windowsill was one of the stems from the lilies. I told her how disappointed I was and how the lilies would soon die. Please don't break off the other stem. Next day, our youngest son, soon to leave for India, he was a missionary came for his next last visit. I told Ken of my rebuke to his mother and how bad I felt about it. As I sat on the porch swing, savoring each moment with him, my son, his mother came to the door with a gift of love for me. She carefully laid the other stem of lilies on the table with a gentle smile and turned back into the house. I simply said, thank you. Ken said, you're doing better, Dad. <laughs> Muriel, Muriel can now only speak in scrambled words, not in senses, only phrases, often in words that make little sense. She can say one sentence, and she says it often, I love you. She not only says it, she acts it. The board of the college, he was in charge of a very large college in the East Coast. The board of the college where I serve as president arranged for a companion to stay in our home so I could go to the office. 
During those two years, it became increasingly difficult to keep Muriel at home. As soon as I left, she would take out after me. With me, she was content. Without me, she was distressed. The walk to the school is a mile-round trip. She would make that trip as many as 10 times a day. Sometimes at night when I helped her undress, I found her bloody feet. When I told our family doctor, he choked up. Such love, he said. I wish I loved God like that. Desperate to hear and be near him at all times. She teaches me day by day of this love. As she needed more and more of my time, I wrestled daily with the question of who gets me full-time, the college or Muriel. When the time came, the decision was firm. It took no great calculation. Had I not promised, had I not promised, had I not promised 42 years ago, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. It's more than keeping promises and being fair, though. As I watch her brave descend into oblivion, Muriel is a joy of my life. <laughs> Pardon me, I'm just thinking about my wife. Daily I discern new manifestations of the kind of person that she is. The wife I've always loved. Daily I see manifestations of God's love. The God I long to love more fully. Here's the bottom line. The way you love your wife is the way you love Christ. Don't cut it any other way. That's the bottom line. We're up here to upgrade our relationship with Christ. And I think foundationally it begins with a decision to upgrade our relationship with our wife. Say, God, when I'm up here, would you show me how I can meet her emotional needs? When I get to the other end, God's not going to ask me, how big was East Hill Church? Did you fulfill the ministry of pure desire and go around the world and help churches get out of sexual violence? There's only one question he's going to ask me. Where's your wife? And is she more beautiful than the day I gave her to you? It's not going to be a pop quiz. I know what the question is going to be before I get there. And that's the bottom line for me. How I treat Diane is how I ultimately treat Christ. Therefore, God, help me with my selfishness. Help me to be a man who really, truly is passionately loving my wife and meeting her emotional needs. I think the first step in upgrading our relationship with Christ is saying, God, I need to upgrade my relationship with my wife. If that's true for you, would you stand to your feet and I want to pray for you. If that's true for you, stand to your feet. Father, we're taking a stand here today and simply saying, help us to be the man that we really cry to be. Give us an understanding of this magnificent woman that you've brought into my life. And Lord, help me to understand what her needs are, her emotional needs, her dreams, her visions, her hopes, her desires. And Father, I'm not capable in myself of being very effective at meeting those needs. So by the power of the Holy Spirit, I open my heart today and why I'm up here this weekend. Would you speak to my soul in dreams and visions and healing touch? Would you help me to communicate your love for this woman in ways that I've not been capable of doing it before? And Lord, let it not be just a moment when I come back, a day or two where I buy her flowers, but there's a change in my soul. So when I walk in the door, there's a different man coming in the door. There's a man who realizes the gift that I've been given. Though we have severe differences, and we always will, Lord, help us to realize the gift that you gave us in our wives. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, help us 
to meet the deepest desires of her heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together and give the Lord an applause offering. Amen? For our wives.